Graphical transformations of functions. Here I am with one of my students, Michael, who wasn't ashamed to have his picture taken while standing next to me. In this lesson, we'll look at the graphical transformations of functions. We'll look at the graphs of functions and analyze the algebra that produces these transformations. We'll look at translations, reflections, stretches, and compression, sometimes also called squeezes or shrinks. Those last two were horizontal stretches and compressions. We'll be looking at what is done to the functions to make the change or transformation. We'll also look at inverse function transformations. We're going to start with this function. This is f of x equals 1 fourth x squared minus 4. We will first look at a horizontal translation of the function. A horizontal translation moves a function or the graph of a function left or right on a coordinate plane. We do a horizontal translation of a function by taking this variable x and expanding it to be x minus h. It's the value of h that shifts or translates the function to the right or to the left. If we let h equal 3, this is what the function looks like. We have 1 fourth quantity x minus 3 squared minus 4. And here's the new function in blue, translated 3 units to the right from the original function. I bring this particular case up at the beginning of the lesson because it's the least intuitive concept in this lesson. x minus shifts the function to the right, whatever the amount of h is in the function, in this case 3 units. So x minus shifts the graph of the function to the right, and x plus a number inside parentheses shifts the graph of the function to the left. And the left shifted function is the green parabola, which is 4 units to the left. This concept applies to the conics and really all graphs on the coordinate plane. This is the thing that is most counterintuitive in the translation of functions. x minus a number shifts the function to the right, and x plus a number shifts the function to the left. Now we'll examine the vertical translation. We'll use the same function, f of x equals 1 fourth x squared minus 4. The vertical translation moves the function or graph of a function up and down on the coordinate plane. In a vertical translation, it's the number at the end that's by itself the constant term in the function that decides how the function moves up or down. I hope you recall that this constant, the number by itself, is the y-intercept of a function. So if we add to this last number to make the y-intercept larger, it moves the graph up, while if we subtract from it to make the number smaller, it moves the graph of the function downward. Let's add 5 to this number. Negative 4 plus 5 equals 1. And here's the function with 5 added at the end, so it becomes f of x equals 1 fourth x squared plus 1. Here's the graph of that function, which was translated 5 units upward. If we make the y-intercept negative 6, it shifts the graph down 2 units from the original y-intercept of 4, which is the original graph, which is now shown in green. Now we'll do a horizontal reflection. For this one, we'll use the function 1 fourth x to the third power, or x cubed, minus 4. The reason we're using a different function is that a horizontal reflection of a quadratic function about the y-axis would not be apparent because the y-axis is, is a vertical axis of symmetry for that function. And here's the function graphed on the coordinate plane. It's 1 fourth of the cubic parent function, which would be y equals x cubed, but shifted down 4 units. To reflect a graph horizontally, we will concentrate again on the independent variable x. We'll take that variable x and replace it with negative x, which we place inside parentheses. This is important, to place it with the negative sign inside parentheses. And this is what it looks like, graphed. It's the graph of the function shown in blue. And we can see that it's a horizontal reflection of the original function in blue, or, or red. Now we're going to look at a vertical reflection. For a vertical reflection, we take the function expression on the right side, the entire expression, 1 fourth x cubed minus 4, and multiply the whole expression by negative 1. Instead of the negative 1 in front, you could just put a negative sign on the outside and do the same thing. I like to keep the number 1 there to remind me that it's negative 1 times what's inside parentheses. And here is that transform, vertically reflected graph of the function in blue. Now we'll look at an inverse reflection. An inverse reflection is a reflection of a function that is an inverse of another function. Inverse functions have as their axes of reflection the line of identity function, or linear parent function, y equals x, shown here as the diagonal dashed line. 
To obtain an inverse function that reflects about the line y equals x, we need to switch the positions of the independent and dependent variables. And here we have both of our variables circled in blue. And here is the function with the x and y switched. We have x equals 1 fourth y cubed minus 4. But since we want to solve for y, we'll use the symmetric property of algebra and switch the right side to the left side and vice versa. So we have 1 fourth y cubed minus 4 equals x. We'll add 4 to both sides of the equation. Negative 4 plus 4 cancel to equal 0 on the left side. We're left with 1 fourth y cubed equals x plus 4. Next, we multiply both sides of the equation, or the entire equation, by 4. The 4 divided by 4 cancel on the left side of the equation to equal 1, but we distribute the 4 and multiply it by the x and the 4 on the right side of the equation. So we bring up what's left and to the right to have more room, and we have y cubed equals 4x plus 16. To solve for y, we take the cube root of both sides of the equation, so we have the cube root of y cubed equals the cube root of quantity 4x plus 16. And since the cube root of a cube number equals that number, that becomes y equals the cube root of quantity 4x plus 16. And here's the function y equals the cube root of quantity 4x plus 16 graphed in blue. I hope you can see how the graphed curve in red and the one in blue are reflections about the line y equals x. This required more algebraic manipulation than what we did earlier in our other transformations, but still very doable with what should be Algebra 2 level skills. Now we're going back to the function we started with. The quadratic function f of x equals 1 fourth x squared minus 4. We're going to do a horizontal stretch of this function. For a horizontal stretch, we deal with this number, the leading coefficient of our quadratic term, 1 fourth. And for a horizontal stretch, we multiply this number, in this case 1 fourth, by a number less than 1. So we can multiply this number, 1 fourth, by 1 half. And that becomes f of x equals 1 eighth x squared minus 4. We see in blue the graph of that horizontally stretched function. Now we're going to do a horizontal squeeze or compression. A horizontal squeeze or compression also has to do with this number, the coefficient of the quadratic term in the function, 1 fourth. But for compression, we need to multiply this number by a number greater than 1. We'll multiply by a factor of 8. So that ends up being f of x equals 2x squared minus 4. And here it is graphed in blue. That's a vertical squeeze or compression. You can call it a shrink, too. Now we'll look at a vertical stretch. For a vertical stretch, instead of multiplying the coefficient of x squared by a factor, we multiply the entire right side of the function by a factor. And to stretch, we multiply by a factor greater than 1. Here's the entire function on the right side multiplied by 2. And here it is simplified. We have f of x equals 1 half x squared minus 8. And here is f of x equals 1 half x squared minus 8. So we have a skinnier parabola that starts out lower at the y-intercept of negative 8. Now we'll look at a vertical squeeze or compression. For a vertical squeeze, compression, or shrink, we need to multiply the entire right side of the function by a factor or number that is less than 1. And here's the right side of the function multiplied by 1 half, which is a factor less than 1. And simplified, that's f of x equals 1 eighth x squared minus 2. And here it is graphed. We see it squeezed vertically from the original. And here is a table that summarizes all the transformations we've done in this lesson. I'll pause a few seconds so you can write them down if you would like. We'll now look at a few problems testing and understanding of the concepts. The graph of the square root parent function y equals the square root of x is shown below. Which function translates this function five units to the left? Stop the video, solve the problem, then restart the video see if you got the correct answer. The correct answer is B. Here's the answer B with its function entered below the graph in my TI Inspire calculator. And here it is graphed. We see the graph shifted five units to the left, confirming B as our correct answer. Again, this is counterintuitive. It says X plus five under the radical but shifts the graph five units to the left. Very important to remember. 
Next problem, for the function f of x equals e to the power of x, which of these functions is an inverse of that function? Stop the video, solve the problem, restart the video to see if you got the right answer. The correct answer is b, f of x equals ln x, or the natural log of x. There are three ways I know to solve a problem like this one. First, we'll look at an algebraic method. We start with the original function, y equals e to the power of x. Next, to get the inverse function, we switch places of the x and the y. Now we change the equation into a logarithmic equation. We have y equals log base e of x. And log base e is written as ln, the natural log. So we have y equals ln x, just like our answer b. Another way to do this is to graph the functions and see which one of the answers reflects about the line y equals x. We can enter f of x equals e to the x in the calculator. And this is what it looks like graphed. Next we enter the function y equals x and graph it. This is the diagonal line left to right, going from the lower left to upper right. The function is marked f2 of x equals x on the graph. And here is answer b entered as a function below the graph. And here are all three graphs together. We see the two functions reflected about the line y equals x, demonstrating that they are inverse functions relative to one another. Next problem, which of the following graphs best matches the function f of x equals negative x cubed after being horizontally stretched by a factor of 4? Stop the video, solve the problem, then restart the video to see if you got the right answer. The correct answer is C. None of the others includes a horizontal stretch. This is one that we should be able to see and make sense of just by looking. But in case we cannot, we can graph in our calculator the function f of x equals negative x cubed, which happens to be the graph for answer choice A. If we go back to our chart, we see where we can make a horizontal stretch of 4, and that circled here on the chart. So if we take 1 fourth of x cubed, well actually that would be 1 64th, or 4 cubed in the denominator, and that should get us the horizontal stretch we're looking for, and graphed, this is what it looks like, just like our answer choice C. Another problem, when compared with the function graph below, which function best represents the graph reflected about the x-axis? Stop the video, solve the problem, then restart the video to see how you did. The correct answer is A. f of x equals negative 2 times the square root of quantity x plus 6 minus 2. The easiest way to solve this is to graph if possible. So here is the function entered into the calculator, and here it is graphed, a reflection about the x-axis. It doesn't match the graph perfectly because of the screen settings, but if we change the window settings, we can see it much better. This has been the graphical transformations of functions. Thanks for viewing.